This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Feinberg. Getting the right diagnosis is an essential part of healthcare, yet diagnosis still relies on human senses. Deep learning, a form of artificial intelligence, has the potential to help physicians catch early disease that cannot be seen by the human eye and provide appropriate care that could save or extend lives. Dr. Mazi Edamadi, a research assistant professor in anesthesiology and biomedical engineering, is leading a deep learning project in his lab here at Northwestern. He joins me to talk about a collaboration between Northwestern and Google that showed the performance of a new deep learning system to predict lung cancer. Thanks for joining me. So tell me a little bit about your path to Northwestern. Aside from being on faculty here and at the McCormick School of Engineering, you're also in a residency program. It's a little unusual, isn't that right? It's very unusual. Uh, I uh, actually grew up in the Chicago area, about uh, two blocks away from the Northwestern football stadium. My mom uh, did her PhD here, so that's what brought us here to begin with. And uh, it's funny, uh, you know, from a a young age, I think I was doing a lot of things that were setting me up to be an engineer. My best friend growing up who now uh, works in the lab, and I've worked with him now for the last like 10, 15 years, we used to go around... uh, so he lived in Evanston. We used to go around and uh, look in people's uh, dumpsters for electronics. And we would take them apart, put them back together, fix this stuff. It's a lot of fun. So that was sort of your way into engineering, the dumpster diving. People throw away a lot of nice stuff there. So did you always want to come back to Northwestern? Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know if it was specific to Northwestern, but I certainly always wanted to come back to the Midwest. And I think, t- to highlight your question earlier, what, what brought me back to Northwestern was this ability to do, to, to really uniquely combine the residency training with the research uh, in a way that goes beyond just myself. I think the, the unique thing about our lab is that we're actually based inside the hospital. And uh, Northwestern was uh, very unique in that they allowed me to put engineers really, you know, a couple inches away from patient care. I mean, they're the, the room that we work in is right next to where patient care is happening. So that really allows for fluid interactions between healthcare providers of all levels, nursing, physicians, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, et cetera, uh, and our engineers. And we're able to work together very closely to solve a, a variety of problems. And I think the Google project uh, wouldn't have been possible were it not for that setup. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that Google project and that collaboration. The results of a paper were published earlier this year in Nature Medicine. Just bring me back to how that all began and what the results were of the project. It's been a really fun project. Um, so how it began, I, uh, I have a lot of close friends. You know, I, I went to school in the Bay Area, so a lot of my friends uh, out there uh, didn't end up going to residency and ended up pursuing uh, other uh, entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, and one of them uh, ended up working at Google, and uh, she really wanted to try and bring the amazing resources Google has, both in terms of engineering talent, computing power, and their kind of broad reach generally, wanted to bring those resources to bear to improve patient care directly. Um, so it, it seemed like a, a great partnership because on the other side, you know, we have a bunch of engineers in the patient care environment, so and we interact with care providers every day, so it would be a natural collaboration. Um, so uh, we started discussing some of the tools and things that they had already been working on, and they had done a tremendous amount of work in medical imaging, and they wanted to look at uh, lung cancer next. And um, so we we uh, worked very closely with them and were able to provide a uh, what we call a validation data set, uh, which is essentially lung cancer scans that have already been taken um, and where we know the outcome. We provide that to their algorithm that they had developed, and we see essentially how well it works. Um, so this was a, a big effort over the course of over a year, and it turns out their algorithm performs very well. Well, right. That model outperformed six radiologists when previous CT imaging was not available and performed just as well as radiologists when there was prior imaging. Um, Tell me a little bit about that result. What was the reaction when this study um, came out? What did people have to say? Uh, Yeah, I mean, great question. I think 
the reaction was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and, uh, you know, many folks have asked me, oh, like, is this taking away radiologists or is this uh, going to, you know, are we all being replaced by robots? And I think this project actually highlights specifically why that's not the case. Uh, the, the computer model can see very nuanced patterns that really are not visible to the human eye. Um, but in all studies in the past um, where a similar thing has been created where there are these slight patterns being seen by the computer that can't be seen by the human, when you put that computer program together with the human, they together outperform either the human by itself or the computer by itself. So I think fortunately um, the reaction was very positive for the same reason. We now have this computer system that can detect these cancers very early, but imagine what we can do now if we combine the human back together with the system. And maybe it'll work even better. Well, it's no surprise that they selected lung cancer because lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer death in the United States. 160,000 people just in 2018. So there's potential to save tens of thousands of lives using this sort of technology and screening. How motivating is that for you as a physician scientist? I mean, it couldn't be more motivating. I, I, uh, this is why I went into the field. I think you know, I had a number of opportunities to pr pursue you know, kind of pure engineering uh, careers and similarly to pr pursue kind of pure clinical and I've kind of held out the long the long fight thinking that you know there's there is really a, a benefit to working in between these fields uh, because we can leverage the scale of engineering and bring it to the problems in patient care which often result in uh, improving people's lives or in this case potentially preventing people from getting cancer so it's I mean this is exactly why I went into it it's one of the reasons I came to Northwestern I think it couldn't be more perfect uh, environment. Well, what are the next steps? This was sort of a proof of concept that this works, but the findings still need to be clinically validated in a larger patient population. So what's happening with the project now? Can this be replicated? Absolutely. So one of the really amazing things about working with Google is they have the experts in the world, not only in building machine learning tools, but in making sure that they are broadly applicable. And there's a lot of nuance here that, again, only a partner like Google uh, has the resources and the expertise to do this. So their concern from the beginning is that not just that this would perform well, but that it would be able to actually be used across the US and across the world, essentially. So we've done a lot of the work to show that that's the case, but there's one kind of crucial uh, remaining project. And that is uh, what we just discussed, which is let's put the tool together with the radiologist and see what happens. Uh, let's see the performance together. And also a, a kind of related question is how, how does the radiologist want to use the tool? Like in what exact piece of their workflow do they want to see this? And again, this is why I love working with Google. You know, if they were a smaller company or a, a startup, I think we would we would have less choice. It would be like, well, this was the easiest way for us to bring this tool to you. So you just have to learn how to do it in this way. But Google's, you know, that's not what they're about. They want they want to bring this to the person and almost make it invisible so that it's something that they use very easily and they have the resource to do that. So another thing we're working on is exactly this, identifying the exact workflow um, and then together with them customizing and building software to allow their groundbreaking algorithm to be used in that exact workflow, essentially. And you mentioned how important it is, that relationship with the radiologist. As you said, this isn't replacing a radiologist. There's really no way to replicate the human element to all of this and the clinical context. Can you just address that again a bit more? Um, I know we're talk what we're talking about here is not that we're going to be able to replicate human diagnosing with machines, right? Absolutely. And I think this is actually one of the most exciting aspects of this work is, uh, and you know, speaking as a clinician, we spend so much time not interacting with the patient. Uh, we spend so much time uh, in our electronic medical record. We spend a lot of time on relatively routine diagnostic activities. If there's a way that a computer can do some of this stuff automatically and even more accurately than a human, then we can focus on, I think, the two most important things which a computer will never be able to do. One, 
and this is the more obvious thing, I think, is the really tough cases, the really difficult cases where there's a lot of nuance and uh, there's not enough of those unique cases that the computer would be able to do it. Remember, deep learning works on seeing thousands and thousands of examples of things. Humans work on seeing one example of a thing. So I think that's never going away and it'll just give us more time to deal with that. And the second is exactly this human element. Um, you know, If I now, instead of having to stare at the computer or instead of being so busy because of all my uh, uh, kind of ancillary activities, can spend an extra half an hour and, and talk to a patient, I mean, I think that's why most of us went into went into healthcare. So I think, contrary to what it may seem, these uh, AI tools are going to make doctors more doctors and make computers uh, help us as opposed to stand in our way. Well, you just mentioned electronic medical records and that you spent a lot of time in there. And we know that deep learning is well suited for analyzing medical imaging. But what about electronic medical records? Where are you on that with those hundreds of billions of data points. You said you're working on some projects right now using the electronic medical record. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, you're right in that there, you know, imaging is just one type of data, and the electronic, electronic medical record is a very rich data source of a, very, a variety of different types. Um, so uh, I think where the field is at, you know, we're, we're probably slightly behind because the data is more complex and requires more work to kind of clean and interpret, but we're getting there. I mean, it, uh, there are you know, billions of data points out there of things similar to the electronic medical record that are not, like take Wikipedia, for example. There's plenty of uh, algorithms out there that kind of read and understand Wikipedia as the antecedent to whatever it is that they're trying to do. So some of those tools can be applied in healthcare. Um, with medical record information. Well, anything specific that you want to mention that you're working on right now that could be coming? Uh, specific to medical records, um, there's a lot of there are a lot of things that we would like to predict uh, as clinicians. We want to know uh, is this patient uh, who we just took out of the operating room uh, are they going to need to go back emergently in the next 12 to 24 hours? Uh, is this patient uh, who we're going to discharge home, are they going to have to come back to the hospital in the next 30 days? These are questions that are important to us as clinicians. They're important to the hospital. They're obviously of great importance to the patient. Um, so I think some of the projects we're working on in collaboration directly with the hospital are trying to get at using the medical record, using deep learning to try and develop better predictors of some of these common things that we would like to know as soon as possible. So your research does go beyond this collaboration with Google and deep learning. You've published more than 40 papers on a variety of technologies to extend healthcare beyond the clinic. As a med student and grad student, you created 10 medical devices. That's quite a few. And you directly oversaw phase one clinical trials of some novel devices. You know, just tell me about some of your most exciting work to date beyond the Google project. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I, you know, I think I started in this field uh, where we had nothing to do with data, big data uh, analytics. It, I started basically studying uh, together with my very close friend and collaborator who's now at Georgia Tech. Uh, started studying basically this phenomenon that every time the heart beats, uh, the body moves a very small, imperceptible amount. Uh, and this is not something that we discovered. Uh, it's something that I think we've uh, better, way, way better characterized. So um, we built a series of devices where, uh, and most of these are wearable devices or devices that can be used at home, um, where we essentially measure these tiny imperceptible movements of the body every time the heart beats. And then we use uh, those data to to develop uh, actionable insights to help take care of patients. So for example, um, if a patient has heart failure, we would like to know uh, is this uh, heart failure getting worse at home to the point where they will be admitted to the hospital. So we've used the data coming from our wearable devices to try and predict this, for example. 
Yeah, so tell me about these wearable devices. What do they look like? Uh, you know, we've been very fortunate to be working on this area in the, over the last 10 years where really an explos explosion of um, kind of personal electronics has allowed uh, the electronics inside, so the things inside your smartwatch or your smartphone, these electronics have become so miniature that the wearable device can almost look however you want it to look. Uh, it's just, it's kind of, the world is your imagination. So, uh, you know, we have the, the device that we've been using most with patients is uh, it's, you know, around the size of a silver dollar, maybe a little bit bigger. I don't know if people even remember what that is. <laughs> but uh, And uh, you've just basically using uh, an adhesive, stick it onto the chest, and it kind of sits there and quietly measures the cardiac parameters that we talked about. But this is a project that you're still very much involved in and continuing to evolve. Absolutely. Yeah, we uh, are running a number of different clinical studies trying to uh, see what can the data from this vibration sensor, what can it, what can it predict? So, uh, so we're looking at areas in cardiac surgery, we're looking at areas in um, outpatient monitoring, we're looking at areas in um, recovery from surgery in general and other other things as well. So how are you able to do this? You'll be um, on service, doing your residency, you're working in the lab, you're publishing these papers. I would just love to hear a little bit about how you live your life here at Northwestern. I think it's a couple of different pieces to it. One is that all of this research is so close to patient care. I mean, we're working on things that we're using on patients or that we'll very soon be testing with patients in clinical studies. So I think I've made a conscious decision to focus on you know, not things that will be used in 10 or 20 years, but things that will be used in six months or three months. Like I've made a conscious decision to work on those types of problems, so it makes it a lot easier. But uh, you know, a second thing is really just testament to the amazing talent in, in my lab. These folks that worked for me had opportunities to work in tech, to work in med tech, other areas, and they've all taken significant pay cuts uh, because they see the they can see the the fruits of their labor directly used in patient care and there's nothing more satisfying than building something in the lab and then the next day you're handing it to a patient and they're thanking you oh my god you're paying attention to this condition that i have or or they're telling you hey this is a little bit too big can you make it smaller or maybe you need to make it longer or whatever and it's uh there that that's that satisfaction is really uh unparalleled and i think allows me to really recruit some of the best people in the business. And quite frankly, uh, even if I wasn't there, they would they would keep doing this. So I think that that allows me to focus on the, on the patient care and kind of balance everything. And you do have younger folks coming in that you're training. I'd love to hear a little bit about that process. And that's one of the things I love about Northwestern is there's this robust graduate school and undergrad. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. We have a number of trainees come through. And the first thing I do is I, I put these folks right in the middle of the hospital, right next to patient care. And at first, they, they kind of look around and they're like, what is this place? Like, this is, this is, uh, this is how healthcare is? Again, though, that, that's time and time again, that's been our greatest strength is we just completely get rid of that barrier. And engineers can see the problems firsthand. They see the fact that, you know, nurses and docs are still sending faxes. We're still receiving pages. You know, some people don't even know what a fax machine is anymore. And the first time they see it is when they come into my lab and they're like, I heard of this in like a textbook somewhere. I mean, we still use VCRs sometimes. I mean, it's amazing. Like, so that's where I think, yeah, the, this is a great place. And then we're able to bring some of the best people and bring them right into the environment and see the problems to solve and then actually solve them. Well, I think we'll leave it there. It's all very exciting new projects you're working on. And um, we're glad you're going to be here for a couple more years for your residency. So we expect you to have, have you back on the podcast to talk about some of your other studies that you'll be publishing and some more innovations coming soon. Be my pleasure. Thank you. A note to all of our listeners, did you know that Breakthroughs is CME credited? Go to our website, feinberg.northwestern.edu, search CME, and start taking some of the courses and claim your credit.